Hey everyone, Nico here. It's April 25th when I'm finally sitting down to record this. I had a very successful eclipse, but right after the eclipse, I had to prepare to both give a presentation and deliver a workshop at an astroimaging conference that's held every year in New York called NIAC. And that always happens right before NEF, which is the big astronomy trade show held at Rockland Community College. So this is actually the first moment I've had to sit down and reflect on the 2024 total solar eclipse and make another processing tutorial. If you're only interested in the tutorial, I did add timestamped chapters to this video so you can skip ahead. But before I get into processing, I'll briefly talk about my experience for anyone interested. So my plan was to drive to Texas, but like everyone, I was watching the weather forecasts in the week leading up to uh, the eclipse and six days out, five days out, four days out, the forecasts were pretty consistently showing that the Northeast where I live was gonna be mostly clear and that Texas was actually gonna be a little bit more iffy. So I kept just delaying the start of my drive and at the same time I was waiting to see how the weather would shake out, I got hit with a freak April snowstorm that dumped a few feet of snow. And uh, you can see me shoveling here. I was trying to interpret what this meant from the weather gods. Is this snow a sign I should get out of New England or stay in New England? And then to add to that confusion, I lost power and internet because of the heavy snow on branches taking down power lines. It's pretty common on my road. And I don't have cell service at home because I'm in a weird uh, dead zone. So a few days out from the eclipse, I'm cut off from the world. I don't know what's going on with the forecasts, um, but it became increasingly clear to me, I guess I'm staying in New England. Uh, so. I had been planning to meet up with Sarah Matthews, another astro YouTuber, and we were gonna both meet up in Texas, um, and we'd been collaborating on using smart telescopes for the eclipse. So uh, yeah, I was snowed in, the uh, road hadn't been plowed. I had to hike in the snow and to get cell phone coverage so I could message Sarah and tell her, you know, it looks like I'm gonna end up in New England, what do you wanna do? And she decided, you know, she's gonna drive all the way out because Vermont was looking really good. Um, so Sarah and her husband Jason stayed here at the house with Maggie and I, and then we drove up a couple hours to northern Vermont for the eclipse. And where we ended up specifically was a farmer's field in Newport Center, Vermont. The farmer was this very nice guy named Shay, uh, who was uh, sugaring, making maple syrup while we were setting up. And he brought us out some very fresh maple syrup uh, to keep our energy up. And a number of my local astro friends joined us, so it sort of turned into a small star party. This is drone footage from my friend Haytham. And it was cool to be on a farm field for the eclipse for a number of reasons. Uh, two that stuck out to me were, one, we could observe the farm animals during totality, and a number of cows were booking it one way right before totality, and then went right back the opposite way right after totality. So I thought that was cool. Another reason that this snow covered field was nice um, is that it was perfect, a perfect surface to observe shadow bands, which are these really fast moving ripples uh, of shadow and light that happen right before totality starts and right after it ends. Unfortunately, the shadow bands were too subtle to show up in my video here, but you can hear us uh, talking about yeah. them. Yeah, right there. You can see oh it. <laughs> 90 seconds observed for shadow bands. Wow. <laughs> wow. Look wow. at the snow. Wow, yeah. Wow. Yeah, look at the snow without your glasses. Since I'm playing this video, let me actually rewind it a little bit because I want to show you just how dramatic the light difference shift is in the 30 minutes leading up to totality. Here's about 30 minutes before totality, and now I'll speed it up, and here's totality. Now, I will say the video camera is not as adaptive as our eyes are to changing light conditions, so it didn't look quite like this in person. It was, it was more like a twilight. This looks a little darker, but it still should give you an idea of just how crazy this is to experience a four minute sunset or three minute sunset during the day. Um, Maggie was telling me she felt like it threw off her internal clock, and then when it got bright again, it felt like experiencing morning in the mid-afternoon. And I, I want to emphasize uh, before I go into the photography details that no photograph or video does the eclipse justice. It's one of those things that you really have to see in person to understand the majesty of it, the otherworldliness of it. And 
you know, once you do see totality with your own eyes, I would be prepared to become an eclipse chaser because it just never gets old. I saw the 2017 eclipse from Tennessee, but 2024 was completely different and even better in some ways. It was like I wasn't prepared for how amazing it was, even though I'd seen one before. Okay, on to the photography setups. I ended up with five setups taking photos and three setups taking video. Most of it was automated. Was it too much? Uh, you know, maybe. But I knew that this was going to be my last opportunity in a long time to drive to an eclipse and take as much gear as I wanted because I was driving. Because for the next 20 years, every eclipse I will be able to go to would be one that I'd fly to. So I'm going to be much more limited in what I can bring. In the processing tutorial that's going to start in a moment here, we're only going to look at data from the Canon RF 800 f11 lens with a Canon R5 on a Skywatcher Star Adventurer. And with the RF 800, I was more concerned with getting close-ups and very fine detail on the prominences and Bailey's beads, which I had more confidence that Capture Eclipse was going to get right with the timings. And also because um, if you use a Canon camera and lens with Capture Eclipse, you could do some cool things with focus right from the software. And that all worked out perfectly. I only ran into two small issues with the RF800 kit, neither catastrophic. The first issue was I stupidly put this kit too close to the guy line of the canopy that I was using. And in the mad rush to remove solar filters, I of course tripped on the guy line and bumped the Star Adventure. So my shots were slightly off center, but luckily it didn't affect focus. And then second, with this same kit, my brighter Bailey's beads shots have a greenish reflection artifact. And I'm not sure if this is because the sun ended up off center in frame because of me bumping into it, or if it's just an unavoidable internal reflection with this particular lens. But in any case, I'll show you how to minimize that reflection artifact in processing, which we can jump into right now. So I'm starting here in Adobe Bridge. This is all of my Eclipse 2024 data. And with the Canon 800, my focus was the, well, I captured everything with it, but my focus was the Bailey's beads prominences. So let's find those. I can see there's the diamond ring, so they should be right there. Let's go to film strip mode. Yep, there we go. Okay, so uh, the Bailey's beads started out really promising with this kit. You can see there's like a single bead. And then if we go to the next one, it looks really good, right? There's like a there's like four beads right there. But then later on, <laughs> we got this effect, this big greenish uh, reflection halo thing. Not uncommon with many lenses and telescopes and different things. Bailey's beads are really hard to capture without some kind of internal reflection. So uh, it's not that this is unusual, really. Um, but I don't want that in my final composite of the Bailey's beads. So I'm gonna do some tricky things here um, that's gonna help uh, minimize that showing up in the final result. The other thing that I'm showing here is we're gonna take this Bailey's beads sequence and make one photo from it. Um, sort of showing the progression of the Bailey's beads. This is a very, common eclipse photo these days if you did capture the Bailey, Bailey's beads sequence. But um, some of what I'm gonna show uh, could be helpful for any kind of eclipse composite that you wanna do. Um, I'm not gonna show the, the basic eclipse composite of uh, you know totality and the partial phases. I'm sure there's something out there that shows that. Um, but it's pretty simple. You would just, you know, cut out each partial phase you want, put them on a canvas and Photoshop and, and you're done. So Bailey's beads though, the way at least I'm gonna do it is gonna be a little bit more work. It's not needless work. I've gone through this a bunch of different ways, uh, both with my 2017 data and with this uh, data set. And the way that I'm doing it, there are reasons I'm doing it this way, but I, I'm, the, as the name suggests, this is an advanced tutorial, so there's gonna be sort of a lot of uh, steps and things that I'm doing here. Okay, with that caveat out of the way, let me grab these, what is this, six files? Yes. Well, we might want that one too. Um, we'll 
No, I guess let's get that one now. So it's seven files because the Bailey's bead starts there. Okay, so I'm gonna grab these seven files. Just a minute, I, to do that, I just clicked on the first one and then shift clicked on the last one. And then I'm gonna right click and say, open in camera raw to open all seven at once. And the first thing that I wanna do is I want to get the beads without this green reflection. And I also want to underexpose them because even at a fast shutter speed, it's, it's easy to overexpose the beads a little bit. So I'm going to turn down the exposure quite a bit, something like that. Um, so just to show you before, after. So just doing that, uh, you know, really kills the reflection. Uh, but then it also, of course, killed our prominences, but we'll bring those back in uh, separately. So I turned down the exposure. I'm going to edit the color temperature and the saturation to taste. Um, part of what's guiding me here is I have this ground truth of this video that I took with the C star. So I'm, I'm sort of editing uh, with that uh, look in mind. Um, and cause I really liked how that looked. You can of course edit this however you want, but at this point, again, I'm just focusing on the appearance of the beads. So Whenever I do something with one of these photos, I'm gonna to wanna to do it with all of the others. And the way to do that here in Camera Raw is I've edited this one. I can now shift click to select them all and then click this little uh, button right here. Let me zoom in on that so you can see it a little better. It's this little button right here and it has like a little recycle symbol with the sliders that's telling you you're gonna apply the settings from the one you just edited to all the rest. So I'm just gonna click on that and click okay. And then each one of these now has that same change to the settings, the lower exposure, the change to the white balance and the change to saturation, right? Okay, so this is exactly what I wanna see, just the change in the beads, right? And I'm not caring at this point what is happening with the prominences or the corona or anything else. I'm just looking at what's going on with the beads. And by lowering exposure, changing the temperature, this looks um, just how I want with as much detail as possible in the beads and showing their changing appearance. Okay, so that's done. What do I do now? So now what I wanna do actually is save these changes uh, into the raw files. You can't do that exactly. What Adobe does is it actually makes uh, what sidecar files called the .xmp files, but that's fine. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click done. And now if I go to finder, you can see it's created these .xmp files with these six uh, or seven files that I opened out of Bridge. So now what I can do is I can go to uh, Photoshop here, go up to the file menu, go down to scripts, and then go to load files into stack. And where it says browse, I'll click that. I'll find those six files. They're easy to find in my file list here because of the .xmp files. I'll select those seven files, click open. They load as the into this list right here as the source files. I'm gonna make sure that attempt to automatically align and create smart object are both turned off and then click okay. All right, great. So now I have all uh, six Bailey's beads shots as layers here in one Photoshop document. And I'll just go ahead and save this. I'll save it as beads.psd, save. 
Okay, next what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back here to Finder. I have these seven files still selected. I'm going to double click to open them back up into Camera Raw, and I'm just going to reset everything. So I'm gonna go back to White Balance as Shot, and I'll just zero out these other two settings that I changed. So this is back to normal, and then I'll just apply that to everything. Okay, then what I'm gonna do next is I want to focus in on the uh, prominences. And so I'm gonna zoom way in here. I'm gonna go into 200%. And the two things that I wanna do with the prominences, since this is gonna end up being a fairly um, zoomed out shot with many different pictures composited, is just make them as prominent as possible. So I'm going to increase saturation. I'm gonna increase clarity. And I'm gonna bring down exposure a little bit until it, it hits a nice balance with these. I think that looks good. Oh, I had them all selected. So I was changing that uh, to all of them at once. But if you didn't have them all selected, you could just click one, shift click to select them all like this, and then just do this again. Just click that little synchronize button and it synchronizes the settings on all of them. So now we're gonna do the same thing we did before. We're gonna click done, go to file, scripts, load files into stack, browse, select the files, open, okay. And it opens all seven into a new Photoshop document. All right, done. So now I'm gonna save this Photoshop document as proms, pro short for prominences. Now we're gonna do that one more time. <laughs> I know, it's a lot of work. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my finder, open up that those same seven files one more time. Once again, reset everything. Okay, and this time I want to focus on the everything else, but basically the corona, the, the interconnecting uh, sort of glow, you know, material here that's uh, gonna sort of connect everything back together. And I want to slightly overexpose this. Um, we can always, the nice thing about, I mean, I don't wanna go that far, but the nice thing about slightly overexposing it is um, I can always sort of tame it back down you know, once we get into the composite. Um, but if you're underexposing it and then you try to bring it up uh, later outside of Adobe Camera Raw, that's not gonna look as good. So I'm just gonna bring it up a little bit um, beyond where I had it. So I think, 0.8, and I'm gonna leave all the other settings alone. And then I'll just apply this to everything. And you can see as we get into the Bailey's beads that Corona is sort of disappearing because um, we're moving, the moon is moving off the sun. This is at C3. Okay, after playing around with it, I decided I wanted this actually at 1.5. And then I'm gonna click done and just load these into a stack and save that. Okay, so now we've saved off three stacks of different aspects that I wanna preserve in this final composite. This first one is how I want the Bailey's beads to look, this second one is how I want the prominences to look, and the third one is how I want the corona to look. So we're now gonna to try to combine all of this data, 21 different, um, images in a sense, 21 different layers into one final composite of the Bailey's Beads sequence. So the first step in that is I want to group like pictures and we can just use the file names to do this. So basically I'm just gonna hit uh, edit copy or it would be command C on Mac, control C on Windows with this top layer uh, 79, and then I'm gonna go to the beads uh, stack, 
and go to paste special paste in place, which would be command shift V on Mac or control shift V on Windows. And so now I have, if I zoom in on this, you can see, I have two copies of this uh, same file, but edited differently because this one is for the beads and this one is for the proms, okay? And then I'll do that again with the Corona. So command C, command shift V. Okay, and now I have three copies of that same file. We wanna do this for, for each uh, of these seven layers. So we're gonna, we're, we're gonna expand our layer stack from seven to 21, because there's gonna be three copies of each um, photo, but processed differently. And then uh, once you have all of that in, what I want you to do is select each grouping of three and group them. And you can right click and choose uh, group from layers from the right click menu, or you can press command G for group on Mac or control G on Windows. And then I'll just uh, give each group a name. So uh, this first one, I'll say, BB zero because that was actually this is actually before the Bailey's beads starts and then I'll go down to this next one and I'm going to do the ex exact same thing for this next file down paste in place go to the corona shot command C command shift V to paste in place and I'll go over here to the layers panel and just like before I'm gonna click and shift click to select all three of the same file names and then press Command G or Control G on Windows. And I'll rename this group BB1. Okay, I'm gonna speed up this uh, part of the video now, uh, but I'm now gonna just repeat that exact same process for each thing until I have all of these different photos that I've created into one Photoshop document. It's going to get a bit insane in terms of a single Photoshop document. We're probably gonna to have to save it as a large document format, um, and it'll be several gigabytes uh, in size, but <laughs> that's just how it goes with this kind of processing. Okay, so I'm gonna speed up this part as I just get everything in here. Okay, I've now organized everything into these seven groups. Each group contains three images in the order of uh, Corona, Proms, and then Beads. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and save this as a new file. Uh, so I'll go File, Save As. And as I mentioned, this time, instead of the format being Photoshop, I'm gonna save it as a large document format because I'm sure it's gonna be over four gigabytes and well, I'm not sure, but probably. And I'll just call this beads composite. And this will be our main working file as we come back to this image. Okay, that took a while to save, but I think it's important once you get to this step of having all the data loaded in to go ahead and save. So then if you mess anything up in the processing, you can just go back to at least uh, uh, this stage in it. Uh, okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate the entire image because this was on the Star Adventurer and I didn't have any ability to rotate the camera sensor. Um, and so I want this to look more how I saw it with my eyes. And uh, from Vermont, this big triangular prominence was actually down here where this one is. Um, uh, if you're, you know, if you're imagining looking at it with your eyes uh, from the earth. So I'm going to rotate everything so it looks like that. So I'll just go to image, image rotation, arbitrary, and I'm going to do 90 degrees counterclockwise. It's going to take a while. Okay, that looks more how it uh, looked uh, when I was actually looking at it. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to expand this canvas a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna expand it in this direction, I think, because I think I want my composite to go in a diagonal like this. I've done straight up and down, and this is already sort of set up to do that, so we could just do the composite straight up and down. I think it looks pretty cool. I'll, I'll 
drop in an image here of what it looked like in 2017. But to just to do something a little bit different, I'm gonna go in a diagonal in a square, I think. So I'm gonna expand the canvas. I'll go to image canvas size, and I wanna expand it in this direction. Instead of doing relative, I'm gonna do absolute, and I'm just going to expand the width to the same as the height. Okay, recenter that. Okay, so now we have this extra room to make our uh, composite in, but you can see this is uh, transparent. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and make a new layer. You can just click the new layer button down here next to the trash can, and I'll fill that layer with black. There is a keyboard shortcut, but instead of telling you yet another keyboard shortcut, I'll just go ahead and go to edit, fill, and fill with black that way. Okay, and so this is now a black layer. You can see it covered up our <laughs> images because it's on top, but I'm gonna, this is a, actually a useful layer. I'm just gonna call it black, um, and I'll be moving this around. So I'm, for now, I'm gonna move it right under BB0. So here's my group of three images, BB0, and then I have my black layer right below that. All right, and then depending on uh, how patient you are, you might save again at this point, but uh, I don't know how often I'm gonna remember to remind you to save, but when you're working with a document this huge with this many full-size layers, I will warn you, every time you save, it, it does take a while, even if you're using fast storage and a fast computer like I am. Okay, I'm gonna close these other two documents. So now we just have beads composite and we're ready to start working with the layers. So I'm gonna start with this top group here, BB0. This is right before third contact, sort of the final shots of just the corona. And I'm gonna start at the bottom with uh, just the beads. I'll zoom in. Pressing Command Plus. I guess this isn't quite the beads yet, but you can see that uh, the moon at this stage doesn't completely cover up uh, this little edge of the sun. So you're seeing like a little tiny glimmer of, of sun there. And that's what I want to select. So uh, what we're basically doing now is just selecting the parts that we want to show from each of these layers. So I'm gonna go select by color range. And I'm just gonna select this. Just this little sliver of white here. Okay, and if you change the selection preview to grayscale, you can see the selection. That can be useful just to see how much it's picking up. And I'm just holding down shift and clicking to add more samples to the selection. I'll check grayscale again. Okay, that looks good. I'm gonna hit okay. You can see it makes a selection outline around there. I'm then going to expand it slightly and feather it. So I'm gonna go select, modify, expand by two pixels and select modify feather by one pixel. All right, and then I'm going to click the add a layer mask button. So if you look down here in the layers panel at the bottom, it's this third button over from the left. If you hover it over it, it tells you what it is. As soon as you click it, it takes your selection and turns it into a layer mask. So you can see now all that we have showing is that little thin bead of sunlight. All right, and you can see now this has this mask, right? Okay, and then we're just gonna continue with that same process, but this time with the prominences layer. So I just turned the visibility of that on over here on the right, and then I'm gonna go select by color range, and I'm gonna start 
uh, clicking and shift clicking. I'm now holding down shift and I'm just clicking all over the prominence here to add more and more samples so that it selects all of this stuff here. Okay, and you can always check it by going selection preview grayscale just to see what it's selected. It looked good to me. I'm gonna hit okay. And this time I'm going to go select, modify, expand. I'm gonna expand a little bit more. I'll do three pixels this time. And I'll feather by two pixels. Okay, and then I'll make the layer mask. And I, before I make it, let me just point out, I know that there's this tendril right here uh, that we do wanna keep, um, but don't worry about it because it's going to be included in the next uh, one. Uh, so don't worry that that's not included here. Okay, so now if I zoom back out, this is what we have so far, just the beads and the prominences. And, but next, we're going to get all of this stuff. And you might be wondering, why do it this way? Why not just accept this as the layer itself? Well, you can see because we wanted to bring out the uh, corona, the prominences and the beads get completely blown out. So it's about doing this kind of HDR compositing. I know that there are other ways of doing this, but this is just a very manual way that gives you a lot of uh, control over the final product. Okay. So now I'm going to do it on this layer. So I'm gonna click on this layer, select by color range, click all over the corona. Turn down fuzziness a little bit here. Let's check it, that looks pretty good. You can see that little tendril is included here because I clicked on it. Okay, and I'll go ahead and Modify, expand, I'm just gonna expand by two pixels and then I'll select modify and I'm gonna feather by five pixels. The final step here is a little bit of manual cleanup where we have these dark edges. So I'm just gonna grab my paintbrush. I'm gonna turn the opacity down to something like 70%. I want the hardness set at 0% and I want to paint in white um, because we want to bring back some of this corona where it's missing. Okay, so then I can just go back in here and bring some of that back in where we have those dark edges. You can vary the size of the paintbrush with your bracket keys. And you can switch between white and black with uh, the X key. And basically, uh, you want it, you want the foreground color to be white wherever you're adding back in the corona where it's missing, and you want it. And you would want to use black as the foreground color wherever you want to uh, remove. Corona if you maybe overshoot a little bit. Okay, I'm just gonna take a look here and I'll zoom back out and take a look. And yes, I think that looks good. This looks very close to how it looked in my eye with that uh, huge prominence being, you know, the most visible. Okay, so we've HDR'd this first layer. We now wanna do that with each group. And then let me show you something interesting here, which is if I close back up this group and I hold down the Alt key on my keyboard and click this eyeball, that makes it so only this group is visible. And what we've just done is we now have just the edge effects of all of this. And we, we need to do that for each group to make this composite work. Um, <laughs> So it's a lot of work, uh, but in the end, we'll have something pretty cool. 
let me go ahead and turn back on all the visibilities. So what I'll do next is I'll turn off this, no, I'll leave it on for now. I'll move this black layer down under BB1, Bailey's Beads 1, and I'll start working on that layer. But to work on it, I'm gonna have to move it out from underneath this layer. So let me click on that layer, grab my move tool, which is at the top of the toolbar, or you can press V as in victory. And I'm just going to grab and move it out like this. Uh, you know what, I'm already realizing, I'm gonna undo that. I want the, uh, <laughs> the diagonal to go uh, from left to right because all of these interesting prominences are on this side now. So um, let me go ahead and just crop off like this. And I'll go down here. I just use the crop tool just to change where our square is because I, I realized I want to make the composite going this way. And I'll fill back in our black layer with black. Just edit fill black. There we go. And now we're ready to go. Okay, so I'm now gonna move this uh, BB1 layer diagonally like that. And uh, while you're moving it, you'll see that these little percentages come up on screen. So it says, I've moved it to the right 4.6% and down 6.1. So it would be a good idea to write those down, remember them, I'll go ahead and do that. You can always change your mind later, but let's say I wanted to do each one in that same way, so they're all equally spaced, I could use that to do it. But of course you'd have to double those uh, <laughs> each time because you're going twice as far, so next time instead of uh, 6.1 down, it would be 12.2 and so forth. Uh, we'll see if that works. If not, we'll, we'll devise something else. But let's go ahead and go on to BB1 here and do the sort of same kind of treatment of HDR fineness. So I'll show this whole process one more time, but then probably for subsequent layers, I'll just uh, fast forward because it's the same each time. You select by color range uh, for the beads. I'm going to select modify, expand that by two pixels, select modify, feather it by one, add a layer mask, turn back on the next layer, just the prominences for this. Go ahead and select those by color range. Okay, and then for this next one, I'll turn it on. This is the Corona for this layer. I'm gonna to wanna to turn off this top group, BB0, so that we're just seeing this. And then I'll do the same thing. Select by color range, add a bunch of points in the Corona. Okay, and I'm going to select, modify, expand by six, and select, modify, feather by four. Add the layer mask. Okay, just to, so we don't confuse ourselves, I'm gonna turn off all of the other groups. <laughs> so we're just having, BB0 and BB1, there we go. Okay, and then I'm just gonna sort of try to match uh, what I did up here with down here with uh, the manual cleanup. And remember, this is just take your brush, opacity at around 70 to 80%, soft brush, set to white, and then you're just gonna bring back in some of this Corona where interacting with the uh, edges of the prominences. Okay. 
Okay. So we're, this is where we are so far. Um, it, I should mention, you know, this has this sort of see-through effect composite. This is one actually way you could go with this. Um, there's lots of different options here. Uh, this is really just a creative exercise to how to present the sequence. Um, I think I usually like to fill in this first one. So I could fill it in with real data, of course. I can go back here to uh, this layer and just fill back in with real data by painting this part of the moon white. So on the mask, of course. So I'm just going to turn my opacity back to 100%. And I mean, filling with real data means basically just making it black again, but it is nice to know I'm not just painting in black, I'm actually using what was actually captured there. Okay, so let me zoom back out and see what I think. Yeah, I think this is gonna work. Um, just trying to, I'm just trying to judge if I like that spacing or if I want something different. I guess let's keep going and then I'll, I'll decide uh, a little bit later on. Okay, now I'm gonna move BB2 out from below these two top layers. I'm gonna click on it. And when I start moving it, here it is. We want to go 12.2 down and 9.2 to the right. Where did I get those numbers? I doubled the last two numbers we used. There we go. And that does look right. Let me zoom back out, see if I like how this is looking. Yes, I do. Only thing I'm not quite happy with is uh, the appearance of the corona it looks a little bit uh, artificial. So I might try to feather that a bit more, but uh, that's fine. We can work on that as we go. All right, now we're ready to HDRify BB2, same way we did the first two. In this case, this reflection uh, artifact is intermingled with the uh, corona. Um, I do have all of this on its own layer. So on this side of the moon, I can just uh, paint it black to get rid of the reflection artifact. But on this side, I can't do that. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm first going to add that curves adjustment. See how much this helps. So that helps a little bit, but then I'm gonna have to do something with this color because I don't wanna leave that in. So I'm going to very carefully select it. And I'll feather that selection. And then I'll add a saturation adjustment layer, clip it to there, and I'm going to desaturate the green and see how that looks. Yes, I think that looks pretty natural. So then let me turn back on the other ones and see how this gels. Yeah, I'm liking how it's looking, so we go on. Okay, so that was uh, more hours than I thought it was gonna be. I actually had to take a dinner break because it was so intensive. But I've put in all seven groups now, and uh, now we're on to sort of final cleanup. It's, you know, 96% there, but the, we, we need a few little touches just to make sure it all looks great. And part of that cleanup is, you know, when I'm just doing this sort of general um, masking, uh, there's little mistakes. So for instance, if you look at the prominences here, they're all saturated. If you look at the ones here, you can see 
um, my desaturation mask to get rid of the optical artifact has extended there. And so I need to go in and find that mask. Here it is, the saturation mask. And then just go in and paint in black uh, to bring back the saturation here. So little cleanup like this um, will will be a definite thing you want to do. So go ahead and just you know examine your whole uh, composition that way, looking for any problems with the mask. Then the next thing is, if you look at how um, these are overlapped, there's certain places where I think it would look better if the ring um, from the last one continued a little bit uh, more elegantly into the to the next copy. So for instance, you know, right there, that looks sort of unnatural. I know that this is a completely unnatural composite to begin with, but just trying to make everything look sort of seamless uh, is, is the goal here. And so uh, the way you can deal with this stuff now is you can actually just um, go in, find the, the layer that it would be. So uh, this would be the second to last layer, right? Yeah, second to last layer. And actually on the entire layer group, you can add a layer mask. And then uh, grab your brush. I'm gonna make it 100% hard now. And I'd wanna paint in black over this little part that I noticed. Okay, so here's before, if I disable the layer mask, you can see there's just a little black thing there. And then if I enable it, <laughs> it fills it in a little bit. Yeah, I'll leave it up to you if you want to go to this level of uh, OCD on this kind of thing. Um, there's some more uh, kind of things where I just think it would look a little bit better if uh, if we deleted some of those. So I'm just going to go in and try to get, knock these out. Let's see. I'll give, give myself 20, <laughs> 20, 30 minutes, see if I can knock them all out uh, rather quickly and... Uh, all right. Once once you know which one you're <laughs> which layer you're supposed to be working on, it actually goes uh pretty quickly. But it's very easy. Let me show you what I just did. It's very easy if you're not paying attention to what you're doing to do that. <laughs> That's what you don't want to do, right? So the the point of this is a it's just a very subtle touch up to have the, the more have it be more seamless between the layers. You don't want to accidentally delete any uh, data while doing this. Okay, so I think I actually did it in like 15 minutes. Not bad. So that's it. Um, basically, uh, the last step here is just a crop. Um, so I'm just going to grab my crop tool. Let's see if square still looks good. I think it does, but I'm. it's bothering me that there's like a little bit more space on this side than there is down here. Um, so I'm gonna try a crop and rotation. Okay, I think we're almost there. I'm gonna get a little bit obsessive about this. I mean, I've already put hours into it, so why not? I'm gonna try to get Exactly the same spacing everywhere. Okay, I think 
that looks good. Okay, so there's our final result. <laughs> Hopefully it was worth it if you stuck with me through this. And if you did stick with me all the way to the end, I think you'd actually be the perfect match for my Patreon. You're seeing the names of my Patreon members now on screen. The Nebula Photos Patreon is a crowdfunding mechanism. It's a way to support my work here on YouTube, but it's also grown to be a vibrant community of over a thousand dedicated astrophotographers, and there are many perks for signing up. You'll get a monthly community Zoom call, occasional exclusive videos, direct messaging support with me, a monthly imaging challenge uh, organized on my Discord server, and that's only open to Patreon members. And all of these things I just mentioned all start at just $1 a month. And then there are additional perks at higher tiers. For instance, at $7 a month, you can watch all new videos ad-free on Patreon. At $25 a month, I'll send you a signed print of my work if you'd like. And so if you're interested in any of this, you can go check it all out on patreon.com slash nebulaphotos. And I appreciate any support you can give. I do this full time now and Patreon is my primary source of income. So thank you to all existing Patreon members. I really, really appreciate each and every one of you. Till next time, this has been Nico Carver, Clear Skies.